ours is a young and vigorous country, its challenges often apparent in the land, but it also possesses some of the worst examples of erosion in the world. So bad is erosion in the high country along the flank of the Southern Alps that the government now spends vast sums of money to help run holders to control it and restore their land. Much of this erosion's natural. We wouldn't have the Great Plains without it, but they took millions of years. It's what's been done in the last hundred years by the mistaken efforts of the early settlers that's caused the present problem. The pioneers burnt off the protective tussock grass to make the land easier to manage, and they put too many sheep on the country, creating a situation which run holders like Brian Beatty now have to face. What we're doing here is keeping the stock numbers down and they're very sparsely scattered over the whole state in sheep and cattle. Uh, the place is just looking a picture uh, right over with the heavy tussock cover we've got uh, right to five and a half thousand feet. And the very low stock numbers have certainly allowed the country to look how it is looking today. On the big shingle fans now we're undertaking jobs of uh, fencing them off and planting with the poplars and any suitable trees we can get to grow to hold the shingle back from feeding the rivers. This work of Brian Beatty's, even when successful, may still have its problems. And to give such areas the chance to grow and establish, the debris in these critical valleys must also be checked where it comes from. The steepest land must be given the chance to heal, mainly by reducing the number of sheep it carries. But sometimes, really bad hillsides have to be fenced off and retired from grazing altogether. But there's still deer and goats, which by crossing steep scree slopes can keep them open and moving. They're not such a problem on Dry Creek Station as on many other places. Hunting has reduced their numbers. We find out the, the best way of letting these screes heal over is uh, cut out the burning on the sunny sides and uh, keep the stock numbers down, spread over very large areas where they don't cause any foot damage through tracking. And our biggest problem then is just wind erosion. The wind does a lot of damage and frost heave and just the natural erosion. What goes on from year to year. Aerial top dressing with grass seed and fertilizer is expensive, but has proved well worth the time and effort in improving high country pasture for stock. There's a lot of natural erosion which has been with people for generations and will be with us in generations to come, but in the past it's accelerated with indiscriminate burning, uh, masses of rabbits out of control, wild animals all out of control. Uh, there was not much care put into the country at all in, in the high country, but uh, today the outlook is totally different. They're caring for it. They're helping to rejuvenate the country much faster than would have ever been possible before and the outlook is much brighter for everybody. As with erosion works on the ground, the farmer gets a large government subsidy on the improvements he makes, which is only right, as these will, after all, benefit a great many people beyond his own boundaries. His cooperation in the catchment board's carefully planned program is completely voluntary. But while he gets considerable practical and financial help towards the future, it will still cost him money now. And each farmer must decide just how much he can afford to spend on improvements which may take years before they begin to pay off. Now, 
High country families must work together in many ways. And the land, with the tackling and overcoming of its problems, must always have a strong and direct influence on their lives. How's it going? Not bad. It's gone off a second, but this year. Things could be a bit tight for a while, even with the subsidies. I'm afraid it means the household ration has to wait for a while. I can see that coming. It'll be a while before we get room of your own. Hmm. It's all right, Dad. I don't mind. The east coast of the North Island suffers from the worst erosion in New Zealand and some of the worst in the world. Not much more than a hundred years ago, the whole of the east coast was covered in dense native bush, its valleys steep and narrow. Then came the pioneer settlers, burning and felling the forest to make way for farms. With its protective cover gone, the land began to change, the hills sliding downwards spreading debris into the widening valleys and threatening to cut off lonely farms. Um, since we have been here, which is about 18 months, we have noticed the river rising because of silting up to about three to four feet higher than when we arrived and it seems to be widening and taking other land and being more of a problem as we go along. We find the biggest problems are transporting uh, cattle, sheep, lambs, wool across at a certain time because once the river is up, well we can be held up for days, even weeks at times to get them out and it seems to be one of the biggest problems. Uh, I find in the middle of winter that we must leave somebody on the farm because of the feeding of animals and because the river comes up so quickly with rain uh, that it can happen within an hour or so and uh, there would be the temptation to cross uh, when it is far too dangerous to get back to the animals. Mike Banks, as a forest ranger, has a wider working view of the East Coast's problems. It's true that natural erosion's always occurred on the East Coast, but erosion's been greatly accelerated by the clearing of the original bush and by grazing of stock, and of course deer and goats and so on. And it gets progressively worse, with tens of millions of tons of debris being carried down from the high country to the rivers and out to sea each year. Yes, Mike, I've had two sets of yards down here on this flat. Uh, the first lot was covered over in 1953, and I built another set up on a higher level. There was a dip, concrete dip, draining stage, the lot there. And as you can see, the second lot is just about gone now. I've had to shift up onto a higher level still, and at the rate it's coming up... To me, Phil's was a typical problem in a typical rural East Coast valley. The riverbed widening and rising each year, paddocks engulfed by mud and shingle, and scores of earth flows which you get in this east coast country, whole hillsides sliding, slumping, creeping slowly downwards. That and conventional slips, like raw bites out of the farmland, and a lot of good lands lost this way. But it's from the massive erosion scars away back in the hills that the greatest volume of debris comes. And yet, in spite of the often drastic changes brought about by erosion, very few people have actually been driven off their land by it. And this is the dilemma of the East Coast. The fact the land's on the move doesn't actually stop people farming it. And because it heals so fast, they don't see why they should do anything about it. Ironically, it's often not they who suffer from what's happening on their land, but the people on the coastal plains. 
Conservation experts who can see the wider picture of what's taking place on the East Coast have not only realized that something must be done, but that it can be done. And large areas of land in valleys like this have been bought by the Forest Service for trees to check erosion as part of an overall East Coast scheme. The scheme calls for complete afforestation of the steep inland country, or critical headwaters of river catchments like this one, but combines both farming and forestry on the easier land. On this easier but still hilly land, it's being found that a combination of carefully managed farming and planting with trees of often quite small areas is a better answer than the original idea of drawing a strict dividing line between farming and forestry. And so it's on areas like this that the Poverty Bay Catchment Board outlines its proposals for land use. The runoff from there is so critical. I would like to see quite a bit of that retained in pasture, and I think the farmer would too, really. Much of this foreland may look prosperous and stable, but unlike the high country, it's land where scars heal fast, and it's worse than it looks. Heavy rains can bring multiple slipping. The steep, critical headwaters hill country is the East Coast's biggest problem. But bit by bit, the Forest Service is planting forests here to stabilize the land. These particular forests are the first in New Zealand to be planted for the dual purpose of timber production, but mainly cover and protection of the land. These trees are definitely checking large-scale erosion. And as they grow, and we plant more, they'll be more and more effective in saving cropping land and settlements down towards the coast from disaster. The Mangatu Forest is where the problem of controlling the East Coast's erosion was first tried out. And each year it becomes more established, with even the worst scars gradually healing. But in the region as a whole, it's still only a beginning, and a tremendous lot remains to be done. Spectacular gully erosion occurs on the pumice lands in the centre of the North Island. This chasm was formed in nine months, and Dave Morrison, a young married farmer on recently developed land, has asked for help from Ian Cairns, a soil conservator with the Waikato Valley Authority. Incredibly swift and severe erosion. Deep gullies carved across almost flat land. This is the price of burning off the protective scrub, of putting the land down to grass, which becomes compacted by stock and allows the water to run off too fast. A major problem created in just a few years. On this pumice land, it's not so much a question of coping with a region as with individual problems. Until you come upon the really bad areas, there's often little sign from the surrounding country that they exist at all. On this particular spot, so much water came down after heavy rain that the road was actually washed away and a car plunged into the gully, killing the woman driver. Pumice is quite a peculiar type of soil. When you get a sloping surface and water can run down it, it'll eat great deep guts in it in no time at all. But on vertical faces, it will stand upright without washing away hardly at all. There was once a lucerne paddock here, but over a period of two or three years, with the heavy rains that came down through it, it got completely eaten away. Pumice is unique. Pieces of rock which get into the streams on newly cleared land actually float along instead of sinking. And the movement of lumps and grains of this pumice rolling and floating down these streams goes on all the time. This is particularly damaging in the trout spawning and fishing streams round Lake Taupo. Yeah, 
Over a period of years, a tremendous amount of silt has been carried down the streams. Much of it is topsoil rich in fertilizer, which builds up the nutrient and weed growth in Lake Taupo, adding to the more obvious problems of erosion. One of the hazards of pumice soil is that streams can cut back in a matter of hours, threatening roads within the short space of one or two severe storms. And conservation planting with willows and poplars is then needed to give protection. Although pumice country may have had its problems, good management has shown that this land can be as good as anywhere in the country. And I think this dairy factory here proves that. Out of heavy applications of fertiliser were necessary to bring the land into production. The lucerne is quite an important crop on the pumice land. It grows in otherwise infertile areas, and the very deep roots go right down through the soil and help to bind it together. So it's an extremely useful crop in that respect. In many ways, pumice country is a contradiction of land elsewhere. The flats are less fertile than the hills, and it's the flat land which erodes more rapidly. Merv Overin's farm, which Ian and Dave have reached, is also on relatively flat country. Hello, Merv. Support David Morris tonight for soil conservation work. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm pretty busy on uh, silage at present, Ian, but just go ahead with the job. Thanks, Merv. We will. Good. The corner of Merv's farm Ian's chosen to show Dave is a good example of an overall problem involving simultaneously coping with its several aspects the stream and valley sides, once just a dip in a paddock, and the protective planting with young pine trees of the hill slopes of its surrounding catchment. In the valley, you can see the streams undermining the cliff, carrying away a large part of Merv's paddock. This is one of the first things we had to tackle. It looks bad, but those willows that were only planted two years ago are already trapping a lot of silt in underneath the bank and building up a protective foreshore and in the end, uh, there'll be no possibility of erosion occurring. Where we have erosion in these side gullies, Dave, we can build these timber flumes, and they're proving quite successful. When it's raining heavily and water flows down the valley, it goes safely over this timber flume down to the bottom and stops the gully eating further back up the valley. Do you think this would work on my place, then? Yes, I think it would. The main soil conservation measures that we have taken in the valley are to fence off the main gully systems and within the gullies plant with willow and poplar to trap the silt. By taking stock out of these areas, the long grass grows and helps to slow down silt movement and improve the stream that flows out lower down. In some areas we have to construct a coveted crossing or maybe even a bridge to get over the fenced off gullies to stop further erosion and the result of all the corrective measures that we have established in the valley is a major reduction in the silt and fertilizer that is getting into Lake Taupo. Well that looks pretty good to me and those trees and that long grass here are holding that well. Yes that's right Dave but there's no doubt you've got to work hard to keep on top of this pumice country if you're going to stop erosion but as you've seen erosion can be checked. Erosion affects us all, and sometimes in unexpected ways. It's not worth it. There's mud in the river. Let's go. Millions of tons of earth wasted in the sea. By the time the results of erosion reach the low-lying plains and settlements near the coast, they've come to a head. The best land and the greatest number of people suffer from and must pay for what may have started as just another storm in the hills. Rivers swollen with unchecked rainfall and debris can prove too strong for their stop banks. Yes, Ted, uh, those banks were designed to take a pretty large flood but uh, runoff from the ranges has been increasing over the years, and there's a lot more shingle getting into the river now. Yes, I'm on 
the way near, so I'll see you later on. Right. Cheerio. As rivers and creeks rise, catchment board engineers measure the volume and flow of water to get the vital information which will help them to strengthen their defense for the future. It's a constant battle to keep ahead. For while a great deal of money has been spent on preventative measures on the plains in the last 30 years, the cure lies in the hills, where until recently, the rate of erosion had continued to increase in spite of the efforts to control it. These trains have been stopped, you know, they're just uh, been held up all over the place, eh? I'm sorry, uh, your wagons may not arrive for a day or so. Now, this flooding has stopped, uh, stopped all these trains for a couple of hours now. Maybe a few more hours before they even get moving again, you know. The breakdown of communications is a constant threat on steep, cleared land. Trains blocked both front and behind by waterlogged slips. Here, the land held by the bush. But on the headland, both railway line and road buried under thousands of cubic yards of earth and rubble. Flooding, brought about by erosion, affects not only communications, but also buildings and farmland. In many otherwise suitable and fertile areas, it can make specialized cropping an impossibility and seriously knock back grassland production. Although the causes of erosion in the high country are better understood, mistakes are still being made. The indiscriminate burning off of bush or scrub or tussock Fires which get out of control and lay hills bare to wind, rain and weather all add their share to the inevitable, predictable results. The greatest contrast between countermeasures on the lowlands and in the high country is that on the plains people must rely on the success or failure of purely defensive measures, whereas in the hills they have the chance of attack and counterattack. Attack against introduced animals and the damage they do on the scree slopes and to the natural vegetation. Counterattack against slips on steep land fighting to get road or rail communications back into operation. To control lowland flooding, the catchment boards must go back to the hills. Thousands of poplar poles are planted, which will grow into trees to hold unstable hillsides. Although they have no roots when planted, 80% of these poplar poles will take successfully. In numerous small valleys, debris dams are built to trap branches, silt and rubbish which might otherwise be carried down by stormwater to block culverts and bridges. These debris dams are simple and quick to construct. Everywhere there's a growing awareness of the need to check erosion. A pilot scheme in the Pariwa Valley near Hunterville in the North Island uses flood water detention dams and similar schemes to this are being built or planned in other parts of the country. Storm water from the hills builds up behind the dams in safe ponding areas, which release the water in a controlled flow downstream, avoiding damage to the low-lying land. Erosion control is expensive, and the cost of major works is enormous. In spite of improved river control, we still get disasters which cost us thousands of dollars to clear up. Whether we live in the high country, the hills, on the plains or near the coast, erosion and what's being done about it involves us all. 